Hey, Coach. What's up, Coach? How are you? Doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Can you hear me good? Good. I can. Yeah, you're all set. Awesome. How about my end? I'm a good on my end? Yeah, for sure. Well, well right. th thanks, thanks for joining me. I know we don't have a personal relationship, but I had the opportunity to have your dad ref a bunch of my games when I was the head coach at Rock Valley. Yeah. Um, and what a stud of a man. And he was always proud of you. I think we talked about yeah. Tommy Kleinsmith, where <laughs> we talked about the next play. So I bet. I bet. He's been he, great to me. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And I told him I, I talked to you and they were doing it. And she said to say hello. And, you know, it's funny. And when I talk to people, my dad's old school. Uh, you know, he, not a lot of love he was throwing around or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I always heard from, from other people how much he, he was proud of me. So that's always good to hear. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, I, I jumped on a bunch of Zooms. I do a lot of things out of Rockford, Illinois. I've been around this area for, you know, the last 30 years and obviously into the Chicagoland area with a lot of Juco basketball. Um, but I've always been a big fan of yours. So I'm honored to have you on, first of all. Um, appreciate it a ton. Um, thanks for having thanks me. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for thinking of me. I mean, I'm I'm honored to be on. I appreciate it. I know you've had some great guests, and I'm honored to be part of that. So thank you. Awesome. So, uh, so I, I jumped into doing these Zoom calls during COVID when I got a little bored and I, I wasn't able to get into the gym, and I started to do it originally with just some trainers in our Rockford area to kind of tell our program who they should get out to. And then it just kind of – yeah, morphed into doing coaching interviews and stuff like that. And it's been a lot of fun, but um, I'd love to, I'd love to share if I could get one thing out of this entire zoom call is um, who's Tom Kleinsmith. Um, and, you know, what, what do you want to be remembered for? But I guess let's start back at the beginning. Um, what got you into basketball, buddy? Yeah. Well, you know, it's my father again. Uh, you know, he's a hall of fame officially. He, he's uh, from the IBCA and, He's in a public league hall of fame and uh, he was a state official for 50 years. So, you know, he would, you know, he had four or five jobs, but his main his, his love was officiating high school basketball. So he would pick me up as early as second grade. I get out of 215. I'm a West side kid. I remember, you know, he'd have the 315 game at Westinghouse with coach Alino and McGuire <laughs> and those guys. And, you know, I didn't know who they were at the time, but I, I, I found out quickly who they were. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was around basketball uh, and around some high-level basketball um, at an early age, even though I didn't know it. And then that kind of kind of morphed into, you know, you get three chances to ref down state, and his first year was, I believe it was, it was Ben Wilson's first year. Uh, sure. So my heroes, obviously, I always looked up to Dr. J, Larry Bird, Barkley, Jordan, all those guys. But my first heroes, you know, were Ben Wilson and Tim Bankston. Uh, Cody Butler, Irvin Small, uh, Darren Guest, Eddie Horton, uh, Steve Bardo. You know, those guys are the guys that I, I want to, they're playing on Illinois, Florida or in high school. <laughs> and I'm, I'm supposed to be in row triple X, but I'm sitting in the first row. I snuck down to watch these guys. So, you know, he had me around the game early and I fell in love with it. And then everywhere I went with him, uh, every time he had a game, I wanted to be with him, whether it was a, a park league or a high school game or a college game, uh, you know, I try to get on the court, shoot during timeouts and stuff like that. So I just developed the love through my father taking me into his games. That's really how it started. Yeah. So, so then you, you play your high school basketball at, at Gordon Tech. Uh, can you talk to just, um, I guess, the audience in regards to your experience there? Obviously, most recently they retired your jersey a few years ago. Um, what did you take from your experience in high school and what, who were the mentors along the way? Sure. Well, there's a lot to name. And, uh, you know, well, first of all, my dad went to Weber High School, which is a Chicago Catholic League school. So uh, he didn't, you know, if Coach Harrington would have stayed at Weber, I probably went, would have went to Weber. My sure. eighth grade year, he went to Elgin. Coach Bonk got the job, was one of my best friends and got the chance to coach together. But uh, I, I fell in love with Coach Pappas, uh, rest in peace. And sure. Steve Pappas is a, a true legend in the state, obviously. But, uh, you know, at the dinner table, <clears throat> excuse me, I could listen to any high school, uh, but I was playing in the Catholic League, and I didn't know what that meant at the time. Uh, you're not playing a zone. Uh, you're playing a physical team. You're uh, playing in a physical league, and you're, you know, so he, my dad was a diehard Catholic League guy, and that, that kind of trickled down to me. So 
you know, from the Gord, I fell in love with Coach Pappas. Uh, it was Catholic League school. And uh, just what I took from Gordon was the toughness and the defense. Those are the things that were really, I mean, even in the seventh and eighth grade camps, it was, it was competitive. Yeah. <laughs> when the ball was on the floor, you were told to get on the floor and get the ball. Uh, sure. you, were, you know, we, we, we spoke of charges, although I wasn't known for taking charges. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we knew what charges meant uh, to, a, to a team and uh, uh, the outcome of a game in those Gordon Tech camps. And then, uh, you know, just the culture of the program, uh, that Coach Pappas, I thought, started, which I was wrong, which we'll get into in a minute. But, sure. uh, you know, just the toughness, the work ethic, uh, what it means to come to practice ready to play, being 10 sure. minutes early, all those things we instill in coaches now. I just thought it was Coach Pappas. Well, uh, you know, obviously it trickled down. It started with Coach Versace in the 60s at Gordon. And then Coach Trebillo went downstate. Obviously, Coach Willie Ray was a Hall of Famer. Coach sure. Bobby Osipko was coach with the Bulls. And then you know, led to Coach Pappas and then to Coach Bogomil. So we, we've had a, a, a who's who of coaching and very fortunate at Gordon Tech. And that culture was instilled way back in the 60s. And, you know, there's still a brotherhood and a love for Gordon uh, that we all take away. And it's built on the culture of toughness, defense, and playing for one another. But really coming to practice ready to play. Our practices were tougher than the games. The games were fun. Practices were tough. And, sure. you know, it all sounds like coach speak. But, you know, when – when you're given this info and knowledge in sixth and seventh grade, it really carries with you through your career. How much time did you put in as a player to get better? Because I know you talk about culture and you talk about an individual commitment, but in my experience, a lot of years, I guess, 30 some years, um, some kid, sometimes we need to define that for yeah. kids a little bit more and they just don't know what it is. And sometimes they get in the gym, but they don't define it. I always, I always go back to the Steve Elford and say, Hey, listen, he took a book and he wrote down how many shots he did and he flipped the page and then he wrote them down again and he flipped the page and he wrote them down again. And it's like becoming a good artist. Yes. Um, what type of commitment did you put in to become a good player? And it all just didn't happen because you were around basketball. Right. It was all day, every day, sun up to sundown. There was a thing called the super transfer. It was $1.75 and that can get you on any bus or any train <laughs> in the city. So I was, I would go all the way out to 95th in LaSalle and see my great friend, Juwan Howard. I sure. go to I go to Garfield Park with the Dillard family from Westinghouse and those guys Len Moffitt and Quentin D Quitman Dillard and and play there. I go to Douglas Park. I go back to my old neighborhood on the west side at Austin and North Avenue. So I played all day every day, and I played against older older kids. I got slammed sure. in the concrete. It wasn't it wasn't a fight. It was how the game was, I thought was played. And, and then, uh, you know, just because you got fouled out, you didn't have to. You know, you didn't have to start a fight, pull out a gun or anything crazy now that's going on. And sure. I played against older guys. So when I was a freshman, I was playing against seniors. You know, when I was in uh, grade school, I was playing against high school players. And again, that comes from my dad to play against older guys, get beat up and get the physicality of the game. But uh, as far as commitment, I started to develop uh, commitment as far as shots. You know, I, 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 I don't know who I heard it from. I can't pick it, but. I heard 500 makes a day was the number you wanted. Not 500 shots, sure. but 500 makes. So if you were a pretty good shooter, it may take you 750 to get in. And if you sure. got a rebounder and you switch off every 25 or 50, you, you get it in pretty quick. Sure. Uh, you know, I hear guys, because I got 100 shots up today. Well, how, you know, did, uh, it's, it's not going to work out for you, you know. Right. I was in the gym three hours by myself, and I got a, I got 150 shots up. So – I think, you know, just learning and then it, it, what's ever instilled in you, how good do you want to be? I think I know, you know, you might ask a question later of shooters born or made, but I, I think the commitment is born. Uh, I think sure. you can become a made shooter. Uh, you got to love it to do it. I mean, your mom can't tell you to do it. Your dad can't tell you to do it. Some guy who writes a scouting report, puts a number in front of your name, can't do it. You either love it or you don't. And that's where the commitment comes in. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome stuff. Um, you know, I, I had the chance to watch your high school retirement uh, for your jersey, um, and I and I watched that actually last night, and it was it was outstanding. I think there was like a thirty five minute clip or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah. Very, um, yeah. And while there was a, a nice ceremony at DePaul Prep for you, um, you didn't talk about yourself. You talked about principals, and you named everybody else under the sun. Yeah. Um, and at about 1130 last night, I started to count 
how many other people that you named in about 30 minutes or 28 okay. minutes into it, no, I fell asleep on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I've no. kind of failed it, but, but it was a significant number. <laughs> um, wh where does that come from? You just, you, you pass the buck. It's not about coach Kleinsmith. It's about everybody else. Well, you don't, you, you don't do anything by yourself. And, uh, you know, admittedly, I, to be a, a, a good player, if you think you're a good player, uh, I always talk about boxers. Uh, to our guys, we always watch the Mickey Ward uh, round nine fight before every season. Did you train to be like this? Is this tough enough? Are you in shape to be this? You got to have an ego. You got to have an ego to be a great player if you want to be a great player. Now, you don't have to broadcast it. It's got to be internal. Some guys broadcast it and it's a bad look. Sure. But as a player, I think I had, I had, a, I had an ego. Uh, and I always didn't like my ego as I got older when I heard stories or stuff like that. And, you know, you get a little older and wiser and, you know, the, the cold youth, youth wasted on the young. And it was definitely uh, wasted on me a little bit. Uh, I needed to be like that in the world I was in to get where I was going. But I didn't didn't always like the stories or the stuff I heard or stuff I didn't even remember. Don't even know if it took place or not. But sure. you start getting older, wiser, you go overseas, you live by yourself for 12 years and you you're very blessed. Uh, that you're still playing the game of basketball at 32, making the money you're making, competing against the players you're playing against. And it, it was really everybody else's help. I mean, God gave you a gift and you worked at it. But, you know, without my park instructor in sixth grade, Jack Hunter, I wouldn't have known a jump stop and a jab step because I wasn't <laughs> hanging on the rim and I wasn't blown by anybody. But, uh, you know, a jump stop and a jab step got me a long way. And, uh, you know, those are guys you got to thank and remember. So, I just, just think why getting a little older, a little wiser, a little embarrassed maybe of some of the things sure. you kind of did or said, uh, you grow up a little bit and, you know, there's a lot of people to thank, a lot of people help. Yeah, absolutely. That's outstanding. Um, so talk to us about your De DePaul years, um, playing for coach Myers. What'd you, what'd you, what, what was your major take? Um, I write blogs as well. Sure. Um, and you know, you don't, I don't think you get a say in this coach, but I get to brag about you, you in the blog prior to the video that I'm going to post for everybody. So cool. I get, I'm not going to share out right here all your stats, but I'm going to add it into the blog so people have the opportunity to read it and then hopefully follow up and watch this video. Um, Thank you. On all your successes. Um, but what's your takeaway? What's the takeaway from DePaul that you want to turn around and tell some young kid listening to this or some young coach turn around and trying to um, pass that on to the next, his next team? Yeah, I, I really, you know, I, it's about relationships. You know, I had a great relationship with Coach Joe. And I, you know, again, I ran him through the ringer a little bit early. Freshman sure. sophomore year, I was at home. I had a lot of friends on campus, you know. I was, and a Coach used to call me in. And it, it, we, I didn't know we were doing it at the time. Obviously, you learn all this later on. But he was building a relationship with me to help me become successful. He knew my faults. I showed him it daily whether in practice or off the sure. court, but he'd call me in and he knew how to talk to me. He knew if he yelled and screamed at me, I'd shut him out. And I'd do my thing anyway. And he, you know, he, he would really, he built a great relationship with me. And then I would walk 20 steps over when I got done with him and coach Ray would be in the other office and he would call me in and it, they, you know, it really trickled down from coach Ray to coach Joe on just how to build relationships with players. You sure. know, you, the old Jimmy Johnson, uh, football coach, you know, when he said it 30 years ago, everybody thought he was crazy, but everybody doesn't have the same rules. And, and it, that's right. always not a negative. Uh, you know, if somebody's coming from my school and they, they live, you know, we got 530 open gym, you know, and these kids one minute late, am I going to pound him? Cause he's one minute late. He got up at 430 to get here at 530. He came 25 minutes. And so he just what, to answer your question, the relationships I really took away how to build a relationship with a player and have multiple relationships and different relationships with team members and then kind of cultivating in that to one team and be successful. And again, did not know this was going on at the time. This was all kind of when I had time to think and what do sure. I want to be to be a coach? And, and then obviously he was just a great X's and O's guy. He, uh, he doesn't get enough respect for the X's and O's that, I mean, he's, he had, unbelievable career at DePaul, unbelievable career in the pros. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people wish he was still there with all the successes he had. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, just taking away from that and then the competitiveness and practice. He was a great recruiter. He wasn't a slick guy. 
He was down to earth and people appreciated his honesty. Uh, right. There was no, no really gray areas with him. Like he didn't lie to you, but he didn't have a hard time telling you you got a chance to be special if you put the work in. And, and kids don't trust people. Uh, uh -huh. You got to earn their respect and their trust. And when you know a guy's not lying to him, you will run through that wall for him. So those are all the takeaways uh, I have from, from Coach and Coach Meyer, uh, Joey, and Ray. But Joey was great to me. Uh, forever love him. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I'd love to hear that story. Um, and, and the fun part about this story is that, you know, I don't know if there's a, a ton of views on my videos, but, you know, I, I got some buddies that hop on the treadmill and are like, hey, Warner, when's your next one coming out? Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing one with Coach Kleinsman. They're like, are you shitting me? And I'm like, no, I'm serious. So, that's great. Hey, if this affects one person and then it trickles down and hits 12 kids, yep. um, I think that's awesome. So appreciate great. it a ton. No, um, thank you. A few, few more questions. Um, the opportunities, playing days, you said you were overseas for 12 years. Can you tell us about that experience and what you took sure, from it? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I didn't get drafted. I was supposed to be, uh, you know, they had me mid to late first, and I didn't get picked. And, it, you know, I was crushed, obviously. Um, you know, and then, you know, it's getting, you know, I got a high, did, did the old green room thing. I got a house full of people, and it gets to 21 and 29, and I get a call to say I'm getting picked to 21, and there's a trade and everything. And uh, it was humbling you, you know what's that thing you're you're either humbled or you're about to be humbled well I was humbled <laughs> <laughs> I was humbled at a good age I, I I didn't have to be humbled at 40 like some of my buddies uh, sure I was humbled early and uh you know I got back in the gym I I was with Seattle for a little bit with coach Carl when you know the year they lost to the Bulls got cut uh quickly uh but I was with them and I was going all through camp I was going about a month and a half and learned from guys uh, like Gary Payton and Sean Kemp and Detlaw Shrimp. Uh, Coach Majerus was actually in that training camp, so I was had an opportunity to be around his offensive wizard wizardry sure. and, and Coach Carl's defensive wizardry. Uh, you know, you couldn't play zone there, but Coach Carl was actually playing a zone. Right. And uh, so it was great. I, I, you know, and then uh, I went overseas. Had an I played for Eric Musselman in the USBL. Oh, awesome. And, uh, you know, I really learned to program. He, he gave me the ball. Uh, we hated each other in the CBA. We'd yell at each other running up and down the sideline. And sure. then the day the, day the, uh, the, the season ended, he picked up, saying, you want to come play for me in Florida? I said, I'll be down there. Too. <laughs> it was great. So I pull him from us all the time. He's one of the best. I just had opportunity to be around some great people early on. And, it, you know, I, I was 225, and I thought I was strong, and everybody's telling me I got to lose 10 pounds. I'm like, I got to lose 10 pounds. I I just gave Memphis State fits. What are you talking about? And, um, sure. you know, obviously everybody else was right and I was wrong. Sure. Uh, and then those guys really taught me how to be a professional. Uh, went overseas, signed a one year, uh, had a chance to come back with Boston. Uh, and Antoine Walker's year to year, he was uh, drafted and Red Auerbach calls me and I had a really good summer. And, you know, you get called in by Red Auerbach and he's telling yeah. me you got a good chance to make the team. And I said, well, you know, I got this car payment. And if I can help me, he goes, well, we're not going to do that. You know, you got to make the team. So again, youth waits it on the young. Probably yeah. had a good opportunity to make that Boston team. Went back to uh, to uh, Japan, signed a three-year, and then I just stayed over there. It was great to me. Really grew up over there. I played in Italy, played in uh, Japan the longest, played in Venezuela a little bit, but uh, was around some really great coaches. What was in Coach Riley's camp for about a month or so, Coach Carl, Coach Musselman. Really a great opportunity to learn the game from great basketball minds who I'm still cheering on today. So uh, extremely blessed and fortunate. Yeah, awesome. So uh, so just for clarification purposes, um, the Gordon, Gordon Tech versus what DePaul Prep is now sure. and the name change. And then in addition to that, just everything that you've learned over the, your, your course of basketball, when you have the opportunity to come back and be the head coach in essence at your alma mater, sure. um, what does that mean to you, first of all? And what were the two or three things that you just say, this is what I need to instill into my kids and this is what I need to bring back or keep going at DePaul Prep? Yeah, first it was, it was a transition. So I was with Coach Wainwright at, at DePaul University, who was one of my huge mentors. He's, he's a great man to me and had the opportunity – Gordon's got this rich tradition of, of basketball with the coaches I named earlier. Uh, and we hit a tough spot. You know, it, was, it, it got bad. It got real bad. And sure. uh, went to York for a year. Gordon opened up and 
had the opportunity to come back. And I, again, you know, I'm thinking of Coach Pappas, who passed away, obviously. Sure. Uh, uh, and, and all the coaches that came before him. And then all, all my friends, I'm still friends with that, that wore the orange and, uh, you know, pushing me to take it. And I, I figured I'd take, take the challenge and the opportunity to try to get uh, Gordon back to where we once were. Uh, sure. To instill uh, the culture that we had through, you know, Versace, Osipko, Ray, Trevilla, Pappas, Bogomil. Uh, it was a tall order, but I had great, great help around me again. I got Ken Griswold, which is one of the greatest coaches in the state that probably not a lot of people have heard of, but assistant coach for 30 years with Coach uh, Kehoe at St. Ignatius and St. Benedict. So got him on staff. Coach Maniscalco, Sammy Maniscalco's father, obviously, uh, got him on staff. He's an old Gordon player. So we got some guys back in the building and still that toughness and that defense. And, you know, to quite honestly, we really had to clean up off the court if we wanted to be successful off the court. And it really goes hand in hand. And that's what I learned as a young coach. You know, sure. I thought you could wild out off the court. You come in the gym between the lines. You got some tough kids and kids who can play. You're going to win. And that wasn't the case. So, you know, we had to come to class. We had to, uh, you know, come to practice on time. You have to have your shirt tucked in. And, you know, you, you had to change the culture a little bit. And then it took off. So uh, I'm just so proud of the kids that built the program, you know. Uh, you know, just really happy to instill what I learned from Gordon guys back into the program we have now. Yeah, absolutely. I know you mentioned Coach Griswold, and I don't know him personally, um, but I heard heard you in your in your um, your Jersey retirement speech talk about that you guys are great friends. You hold the same principles, but you also uh, speak your truth. Yeah. Um, and can you expand on that a little bit? Because sure. I, I think sometimes kids, I don't want to say nowadays because I think everybody else's changes around kids, mm -hmm. not necessarily the kids. I think I personally think the kids are the same, yep. but um, you know, not t telling the kids the truth mm -hmm. and holding those principles, like you'd said in your, in your retirement or not your retirement speech, your Jersey retirement yeah. speech, but um, can you speak a little bit about principles? Can you speak a little bit about speaking <laughs> the truth? I think that's important for kids to hear because sometimes they shun away, especially in today's AA, AAU world. Sometimes you, you tell a kid one thing and all of a sudden it's like, well, I'll go find somebody else that'll lie to me. All right. And I, I think we talked about a little bit earlier about the trust factor. I mean, if they trust you, they'll listen. Kids, I learned from sure. Lance Irvin and the Irvin, kids want to be coached. Now, they won't tell you that all the time, but they want to be coached. And I learned that early. And, you know, if you it, – let's see, how do I say this? They know if you're lying to them. They know first if you're lying. They know yeah, if you run right, a two-minute right. drill. If you can't run a two-minute drill, they're going to be, I'm not listening to this guy. You can't even run a drill. But they know first. So once you realize that and then you're real with them, and, you know, it, it's tricky because you can lose them. Because, sure. you know, you get the wrong kid or he needs a father figure or he's not – you know, doesn't get the love he, he he gets he wants at home, and you know you're telling him the truth. He might back up on you, and then some kids take that in, and and they they understand it early. Um, so no gray areas with us. We got no problem like that, Coach Coach uh, Joey Meyer. I was talking about earlier. There's no gray areas. Uh, if you do something really good, we're gonna tell you all the time. We're gonna applaud yeah. you. And if you do something bad and it's not acceptable, we're gonna let you know that as well. And when you get one kid buying into it. And then it will trickle down. Uh, yeah. You know, it helps if it's the best player or one of the best players, but it doesn't always have to be. It could be the, the leader, the sixth man on a team that, you know, when you are or I aren't in the locker room, make sure there's no problems in the locker room. And when, when they buy in, they all seem to buy in. So uh, it's tough, though, because I agree with you. Um, I don't think the kids change that much. I think the parents have, you know, yeah. to tell you the truth. Um, so. Uh, I just think instilling that uh, trust first and then and then being real with them like they would say, I think they respect that more. And that's that's when you get them to play for it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, 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 sh I share that belief. And sometimes sometimes I, 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 I fall victim to speaking the truth a little bit too much. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I would rather have it that way than the other way, because I, I try to tell my kids, it's like, hey, speak the truth, share it. And then we move yeah. on. Yeah. Um, and it and it's it's worked for me. And it obviously works for you. And I just, I love passing that to the next young coach who thinks all of a sudden I need to try to make a kid happy. Yeah. A um, uh, couple, couple last questions for you, coach. Sure. Um, what is coach Tom Kleinsmith's legacy 
in one sentence? <clears throat> Boy, I don't know. As, as a coach, not a player. We, yeah. we, you've already cemented your, <laughs> your player status. Um, let's see. I don't know. It's tough. I feel weird talking about myself. Um, what, what, what would you, if, if it wasn't a legacy, yeah. um, I, I what guess, do you want to pass on to the next coach? Maybe it would be an yeah. easier question or an easier approach because you're a humble guy and obviously yeah. don't brag about yourself. No, I, I, I I just think that, I, you know, when I got into it, you know, coming from playing overseas, I thought it was about, man, it's about wins and losses. I want a state championship. I want four Catholic League titles. I, and then the first day I get a kid coming to practice when I was at, I, you know, my first head coaching job and the kids messed up in practice. Sure. And I like immediately was like, this ain't about wins or losses. This is about kids, you yeah. know? So, you know, as a, a, we're competitors and anybody watches and coaches, we're all competitors. I think I want to be known as a guy that cared about kids and helped kids. You know, I'm, I'm as proud of the kid that doesn't play basketball in, in college, uh, like a Perry Cowan or a Ty Johnson or a Raekwon Williams who's playing in the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm, I'm as proud as a kid that got the academic to U of I, you know? Sure. So I, I really, I have graduated from wins and what my record is and how many championships I won to it's really man about the kids. And it could seem, it may seem corny or cheesy or something like that, but I've uh, I've been around some kids who have some tough spots, man. Yeah. They come from some tough lives. I'm sure you have. And to see them get academic scholarships to Illinois where they didn't have books for two years and I didn't even know about it because they were too proud to tell me or they're living on the train and coming to school. And, that, you know, they got a 3.9 and they, you know, that it's really about the kids. I just hope that I'm remembered that I, I wanted to help kids, not only in basketball, but, uh, become good citizens, fathers, husbands, mentors, and pay it forward. You know, what I'm, what Coach Pappas and Coach Ray and Coach Osifka did for me, maybe they'll do for somebody else. So that's why I like to be remembered at. Awesome. Well, that 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 concludes this, Coach, and you just you just summarized everything I was looking for in regards to hopefully sharing this information with the next coach to turn around and then pass it on. Cool. Um, and if we can have more relationships built um, out of this interview. Um, it's a happy day for me. This is awesome. This has been great. I love it. I could do it all day long. And we, do, you know, we don't do it enough. Like the, I, I know the Catholic league coaches, the older guys in the league say, man, we used to, we used to compete and try to try to rip each other's throats out. And then we go have a beer and it doesn't happen anymore. You know, like they'd have golf outings and stuff. So I love, you know, I got great for Levitino and Hyde camp and coach Taylor over at Mary Catholic. We're close and love just sit around and talk ball, man. So if you're ever down here or want to come down here, man, We'll sit down and talk some hoops, man. Awesome. I, I don't I don't think we should ever get rid of the win or lose we booze concept, but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would <laughs> probably I'll take you up on that coach. And um this is the highlight of my day. So thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. This has been awesome. Thanks, coach. Anything you ever need, let me know. All right, thanks, buddy. You're the best. Thanks. Bye. Bye.